Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very excited for today's episode because we have our first panel on the show. We are welcoming Vanessa Rodriguez, who is the Educational Opportunity Program Director at SUNY Broom, also a Binghamton alum. We have Jarvis McCowan, who is the Assistant Director of the Multicultural Center at SUNY Delhi, and he is a PhD candidate. And last but definitely not least, we have Mark Sanders, who is the Assistant Director of Enrollment and Student Success at SUNY System Administration. All of these individuals have gone well outside their job responsibilities to take on the Men of Excellence initiative because they are committed to the work. So we are um, going to be focusing on how to really create networks of support and mentorship for men of color today. I'm going to jump right into this because I know everyone is going to have some very valuable insights on this panel. Thank you for joining me to all of you. Uh, first question is, can you just kind of tell us what the Men of Excellence Initiative is? Want me to take the, that one? <laughs> cool, I figured so. So the formal title or formal um, introduction to it is the Southern Tier Men of Color Achievement Consortium, and it is an initiative designed to bring together or centralize the men of color programs within the southern tier so suny delhi its institutionalized program formerly titled um, men of distinction academy suny brooms which is the first of the three programs that i'll talk about that was launched as the men of excellence initiative and suny Cortland's uh, multicultural uh, men's initiative and Oneonta is kind of in the loop here. Uh, they're being brought on with their Brothers for Empowerment program. Uh, it's not yet institutionalized, but we wanted to focus with the institutionalized programs. More so because these programs have dedicated staff and they may or may not have some kind of budget, but at least a dedicated staff. And for most of these institutions, except for Delhi, um, I think it's critical to, to remind folks that for example, Vanessa, folks at Cortland, this is something that they do in addition to their full-time job. Um, so, and you centered that at the beginning that we're doing this outside of our roles and responsibilities that we're financially um, paid to do or we're hired for. So the Southern Tier Men of Color Achievement Consortium uh, is sponsored by SUNY Systems Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and their um, Academic Excellence and Diversity uh, Initiative Grant. And it has short, three short-term goals. Uh, one, to target three institutional programs. So I'm thankful that SUNY Broom and Cortland signed off on wanting to join me in this um, initiative. And then our second short-term goal was to launch a regional summit, which we did back in March of this year. Our long-term goals really to serve as a resource to educational environments within the Southern Tier, both K-12 and college. Um, we want to develop some educational resources for folks along their journey of creating, sustaining, and launching men of color programs. Uh, and then finally, continue to present um, our experiences at conferences. For example, we presented at the uh, SUNY Systems Diversity Conference uh, last year. So that's a little bit about the consortium um, in terms of my idea and at least launching it. I'm happy to pass it on to other folks that want to talk a little bit about um, how they see their institution uh, thriving in the experience. Um, I have been um, super excited to be part of this initiative. Um, I think that uh, uniting with folks who are doing the same work is not only helpful for our students because they're getting to network with each other from different institutions and so we're teaching them networking in that sense, but it's also um, really good for our souls, right, to, <laughs> to get together and to, you know, talk about the issues and, and to um, have fellow um, professionals who are working on this stuff and and be able to you know toss things at them and say what do you think about this right so I think that that's also um, been very beneficial and I'm super excited about it yeah I like that you're able to highlight that this is an initiative that also helped your own professional networks right so helping students and helping um, yourselves as well can you kind of elaborate a little bit on how um, this initiative really helps men of color enhance their networks? Sure, um, I mean, we've, we've had several um, 
events um, that Jarvis has set up where uh, SUNY Rome students, with Dell High students, with Oneana students, with Cortland students, they're all kind of together. And um, fun, sometimes it's a really fun environment, like we're watching a football game. Um, and since sometimes it's a more formal environment um, with the consortium, um, we had a uh, conference in March. And um, I would pass the ball to Jarvis to talk more about that. But yeah, um, so that allows them to really be in spaces where they're talking about issues um, with each other that pertain specifically to their lived experiences in predominantly white institutions. Um, and I think that the camaraderie that's built is really important, right? You're not alone. <laughs> There's so many of us out there. Um, and then we're all here to support each other. Yeah, just to add a, on a little bit of that. So the, I'll talk about the conference, but I'll talk about, answer the question as well. I think these kind of programs enhance students' sense of belonging, to feel connected to the college that they go to so they can say that here's my experience and here's how it's validated in this environment. This environment recognizes my humanity uh, because they have this design program just for me. Um, access to leadership, training opportunities, um, enhancing your social capital is key. And I don't go a month without getting an email from Mark Sanders about, hey, have you reached out to this group or do you know this person or can you join on this? So that, that's a key of social capital for me as a professional. Now for students, the Men of Color uh, Leadership Summit that we hosted at SUNY Cortland, that brought in maybe about 90 folks, students, educators, um, K-12 community and college. And that was designed to provide young men of color with access to folks that may look like them share a racialized identity, share a gender identity, et cetera, um, and learn through workshops and keynote presentations, um, exciting kind of bonding opportunities. You get to eat lunch, so break it, sharing a meal together. And all the while you're learning about what it means to engage with somebody who has a shared identity, but a different experience or a similar experience. And when you put this group of students in a room, with people who can be seen as mentors, the magic just happens, like exchanging of business cards, phone numbers, emails, and they follow up. Uh, for example, so Broom uh, hosted really the first Men of Color Summit in the region. Uh, when was this? 27? 2016. 2016. What a year. Uh, 2016. <laughs> and we brought in a keynote speaker who was also the keynote speaker at Cortland Summit. And the students that participated in Broom Summit back in 2016, they still know to this day the keynote speaker from Broom. They have his contact information. Whenever I talk to, for example, a former student who graduated from Broom and went on to graduate from Ithaca and now is successful in his career, he's, every time I talk to him, hey, do you tell, tell Mr. Good, I said hello. And I'm like, you tell Mr. Good hello. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll call him. But it's those kind of interactions, they still uh, remember the people that they were connected to four years ago. Um, and I, I think it's important for us to think about relationship building through an asset, that our young men thrive from relationships. And when we can put them in positions to be uh, with someone who could be seen as a mentor or, or a coach or a guider is essential. Um, and I would pass it to Mark, because I, I believe he's got the networking for us <laughs> down. Well, yeah, absolutely. So uh, just to come from my perspective, uh, we, um, from my office, we recruit all throughout New York State for uh, all 64 campuses, but specifically for the 48, oh, now 49 EOP programs. Um, and it it's great to see that when we're talking to students about SUNY um, and that they're excited about the communities that they will potentially join or will join, uh, come in the fall, uh, upcoming fall for their, after their senior year, but to see the connectiveness and actually experience the power of SUNY of 64 campuses or, you know, whoever, or those campuses that they're near and create not only a relationship, but a network, not only at their schools, but at surrounding schools. And I think that's where the power comes in and, you know, the Men of Excellence program because it, it links those students together. Other than, you know, I think there's other pathways like maybe uh, student government that has that for SUNY, but for men of color, it doesn't exist. So this is the gap that the men of excellence is filling when it comes down to, you know, broaden the student networks from SUNY to SUNY. 
Um, and I think that's just like, you know, increasing the camaraderie, not only of the school, but also just like, I'm a SUNY student. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that all of you. I feel like sometimes we're in spaces where we don't often talk about difference, right? I love that this is an initiative that embraces those differences and says, you know, we're specifically going to be helping men of color and just the long lasting networking and very intentional networking that comes from it. And there's also that side of mentorship, right? So mentorship, I feel, is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Um, it means different things to different people. But from my perspective, you are doing mentoring, uh, mentorship and networking right. So can you talk to me about what that means to you? I think um, the first thing I would say about being um, or providing mentorship uh, to students is that it's definitely a work of heart. <laughs> um, you really have to love your students and love um, the idea that you're going to be part of their life. So Jarvis mentioned earlier um, that our students still remember the people who originally helped them out. Um, I have been friends you know with our students on Facebook I still get um, Facebook messages or inbox messages asking for my specific advice about things right um, and I think that that just says volumes of the relationship that we're able to build with the students and so you really need to be willing to give of yourself um, and also be humble enough to recognize that these students bring an incredible amount of um, wonderful to the table right and that um, even the ones who are a little more uh, rough around the edges, they're going to become diamonds. They just need a little polishing, right? And so if you believe in their ability, even when they don't, you'll see them grow by leaps and bounds. Yeah, I, mentoring is, is difficult um, on both ends and it should be. Uh, it should be constant, frequent, exhausting. Um, I'll, I always share a story about my mentoring experience when it, when it shifted from when I knew that this is a mentor. Um, I was a good, a good undergrad student. Nobody ever needed to question whether or not I was going to succeed in the classroom or outside the classroom. And I don't share that to, to boast or anything. It was just, I was a good student. And my mentor wanted me to apply to an undergrad research program in the state of Iowa. I had never le really left the state of Virginia, at least on a plane. And I had a month to apply. Day one goes by, Jarvis, you read the application. I said, no. Day two, you apply, no. Day three, day four, day, day 29, Jarvis, have you applied? And the same answer is no. But I share that to say the frequent, consistent, never giving up on a human being. And that is mentoring. No matter how many mistakes, I made 29 mistakes by saying, no, I didn't apply. And I had still an opportunity to a redemption or at least applying. And I later got that internship opportunity. But if it wasn't because of that continued rigor, emotional, caring, just questioning and caring for me, I wouldn't have been able to be where I'm at leading or working with men of color programs. Um, I don't know, I would be on a different path probably. Um, there's also reverse mentoring where my mentor and I have gotten to a position, one of my mentors rather, have gotten to a relationship where he now asks me for, for guidance. Um, and it's the same mentor who I shared the example with. So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful relationship that I think about now in my career that uh, we're def we're now colleagues, and it came from a place of I was just a very lost soul in undergrad. This big thirty thousand student place I had no idea who I was, but he gave me an identity or helped me find my identity. Um, so mentoring is a lot about being able to help somebody grow into who they don't even have an idea of who they can be, but somebody sees it in you and they keep on pushing. I think that for me is mentoring. Um, and I love Vanessa's example. I see it on Facebook, Miss V, Miss V. So it, it's, it's nice to see. 
I think it's also, I just want to say, it's also important that you recognize that if you're going to take on the role of mentor, that this is not going to be a one year thing, right? Like this is going to, you're, you're really going to be building a relationship and Jarvis just exemplify that perfectly. He has a mentor that he's known since probably he was what, 18 and he's not 18 anymore, right? So yeah. 10 years or whatever. 10, <laughs> 10 years. We yeah. had a conversation not too long ago that it's been 10 years, a third of my life. It's that's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have students who I've known since they were 18 and they're, they're now in their mid thirties. So <laughs> it's just, and the beautiful thing about that too, is being able to connect students to opportunities because those students have now gotten further along in their career where I can say, like, for instance, um, we have a, a man of excellent student who's trying to get into the, um, broadcasting um, industry and he has a job within CBS and I just hooked him up with another a former EOP student of mine who's grown and I said hey this these two need to meet and so that student who um, I had several years ago totally was down with meeting this new student who or this new person in his industry and and um, totally was down with the idea of mentoring him in the industry so that's that's really cool when you've been doing this for years um, and and making students you know look back and, and and extend a hand right to the people who are coming after them um, and i think that's important to um to help foster within our students that we're mentoring that you know your responsibility now is you gotta give it back right and so um but yeah it's been it's been a blessing but it's uh, it's also a lot of work <laughs> yes and, I, and if i could just kind of echo the sentiments of that i feel like Men, there's different stages of a mentoring start like hey i have a problem can you help me but then like vanessa said like you end up caring about that person way well i mean you know the the care and the, the mentorship evolved not only for that problem but for the whole aspect of life right just like hey i'm about to buy a car like what, what what's going on <laughs> how do i do this <laughs> you know and so and and it, and it just keeps going with life you know because we you know when mentoring whether you know you're that person that they see they, they have answers that's really um positive i mean you know guiding them in a positive direction it's like well they were right about this and maybe they'll be right about that and it's funny because in my interaction of interacting with thousands of students across new york state is like how do i maintain some sort of mentorship relationship and it's difficult but uh what i try to do is that the students who i have mentorship relationships with i try to bestow that same level of information and just insight to them that even if they're not asking the questions i'm, I'm giving them the, the information that they need to progress in a, on a far more meaningful and intentional way i also yeah uh, just to piggyback on that they're not always going to hear what you want them to hear when you want them to hear it sometimes you'll see the the seed planted that you planted four years ago all of a sudden blooming you know um, and, and it also means being willing to have the hard conversations, right? Um, I love you enough to tell you when you're wrong. <laughs> Sometimes you have to tell them where they're going down a wrong path or they've made some wrong decisions and then how do we get them back on the right path? Yeah, everything that you're saying really resonates with me and it kind of, um, thinking about my own uh, mentoring, right? I often get people who say, well, you don't work at any Oneont anymore, they're not your students, right? And I'm like, mentoring is a lifelong relationship. They are always gonna be my students. I'm always gonna be invested with them. The car example is resonates with me, Mark, because I have students that reach out like, how do I do this insurance thing? I'm looking at a car, what's going on? So it becomes just, you are that support for them it's more of like that family kind of bond right and you become very connected to the students that you work with um so kind of broadening it out a little bit outside of mentoring and networking because i know that the this initiative does so much work um with men of color can you talk about other aspects of career development that you've been able to help students with I mean, I, I can definitely start on this. I mean, my job is basically to support students from, you know, get into college and, you know, and give them and identify resources while they're there. But I feel like it's a disservice to the students that I, I work with and, you know, and the people that I work with, and we just stop right there. <laughs> so um, I feel, you know, at SUNY, we work with the uh, Applied Learning Office at SUNY, and they basically have a variety of resources and networks for students um, to, you know, to delve into career paths or, you know, experiential learning um, opportunities where they get to 
opportunity to experience um, and then, you know, and then leverage that for, uh, you know, their goals after college. And I think that uh, just to kind of give you some examples, uh, there's something called the Purple Briefcase. I'm not for sure if anybody's familiar with that. Um, there's also the uh, financial literacy, um, you know, SUNY Smart Track tool that's also free for students. And it has a phenomenal career uh, research tool where students say, hey, I want to become, um, you know, an art therapist, right? So they basically lay out the, the, the steps that students have to take as far as how long they have to, what degrees do they need, how long they need to be to school, and then also where these jobs exist in New York State and around the country. Is this a thriving job market for you in the place that you choose to live? Oh, wow you know, figuring out, you know, what my financial, uh, you know, how can I elevate my financial resources? And so it's just a really great tools that I've been using um, and, um, and it kind of we uh, weaving that into the information and the guidance that I give, um, whether I'm on the road recruiting or while, um, you know, I'm at a, an event talking to students one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I think, um, so some other things that, kind of connect to the broadening of career advice and guidance. So our program at SUNY Delhi is embedded in our multicultural center. So a lot of the workshops, weekly events, exposure for our specific program is around how can they kind of think about the multiple dimensions of their identity. So beyond race and gender, but also thinking about sexuality, um, also thinking about other gender identities beyond their own, other racialized identities beyond their own. Um, so we hit on a lot around privileged identity exploration. They're men of color, right? Society, uh, social, socially, they are a marginalized group of folks. When we think about within their group of maybe being black and a cisgender man, what does that mean to be a better ally or advocate for? Black women, black trans folks, black queer folks. Uh, and that's where the tension comes in for our program. And that's when we just shifted and well, what are you gonna do in the workplace? What are you gonna do in your, uh, when you're on the job market and somebody asks you an interview question about, can you tell me a time when you effectively worked across difference? So when they see those gears turning that I'm not just being a person who's trying to help them or give them a headache for a day, that I'm actually training them to be essentially just a better person. Um, they kind of retract all the gears and say, okay, I do need to think about my identity, even though I have this marginalized identity. When I think about my own community, I have this sense of privilege that I'm still trying to wrap out and I have no idea what it means. But when I get into the workplace, this is going to be an essential skill that I need. Um, so ours is around multicultural skill development. Um, they do presentations. Um, Email etiquette is humongous in our program because um, we require them to reach out to their mentors, not wait for their, men for their first meeting with the mentor. So how to formally write an email instead of, hey, my name is Jarvis and you're my mentor. Um, so those kind of skill development piece, I think, for us, our program and what it means in the long term career-wise. I think the only thing I, I have to add is, yeah, sort of what Jarvis was starting to talk about there is uh, the soft skills, right? The soft skills that they need to develop and, and acquire um, so that they can present themselves in the best possible light in a job or interview situation. So code switching, we talk about that very explicitly. Um, etiquette, all types of etiquette, right? Um, showing up to things on time is important, and here's why, right? Um, responding to people if they're reaching out to you is important, and here's why. So we, re we really do a lot of the like Microsoft skills because I think that um, our students are coming up in a world where um, they're not necessarily being taught that before they get here um, or before they get to college, right? Uh, a lot of text messages, it's not even, you know, the grammar's not there right and so they take the, that understanding of how you're supposed to communicate to a uh, an email and you know oftentimes get it wrong right so we we try to hone those skills um a little bit we also um have exposed them to professionals so um i work uh with our vice president of um of uh, student development and chief diversity officer. She's really big on uh, getting um, our males of color connected with other males of color in different businesses. So she's held 
uh, I forgot what she called the event, but there was an event where she invited local um, businessmen of color to come and talk with our um, our men of color. And it was like a speed dating kind of thing where they got to sit with individuals and talk with them one to one and go around the room. And there was there was like 50 people um, who showed up. So it was a really, you know, really good thing. And I think it was empowering for those students to see how many um, black owned businesses or CEOs or, or professionals that are out there um, that they may not have had uh, exposure to previously. So those are the types of things we're doing um, at SUNY Broom to help with um, the career development piece, in addition to what Mark and, and Jarvis were saying. Yeah, you've all really talked about how you take this well-rounded approach. I was noticing that too, Vanessa, like you said, Mark, with the very practical, like those resources are great. Students, I encourage you to utilize them. And then that communication, um, the intercultural competency and fluency kind of aspects, and just critical thinking about how you'd behave in the workplace in those kind of conflict scenarios around different aspects of identity is super, super important. Um, so, as we've heard, there's so many benefits for men of color to really link up with affinity groups that they connect with. On the other side of it, though, um, there are different student organizations that um, really focus on, say, finance or economics or, um, you know, business kind of thing. And that would be beneficial for um, men of color to be a part of those groups as well. But there are some times where um, men of color will go to one or two meetings they kind of don't really feel connected to it and aren't that motivated to go back and connect to these other student organizations so do you have tips for students who find themselves in those situations uh, one of the earliest first things that comes to my mind is if you don't i guess so if there's not somebody or something that is representative of what helps you find your passion or that little, when your heart starts beating, if that's not there for you on the campus, reach out to your uh, student activities office, or if you have a mentor, they hopefully can guide you to that student activities office. Um, but you can create your own um, organization that will be for you. And you'll find that you were not the only one who had this passion area that other students might flock your way. On the same time, at the same time, I push students to maybe go give it another try. Um, so you may have gone to one or two meetings and something may not have gone right your way, but that was that one time, that one moment. You may miss some critical information that fourth meeting that you didn't go because you gave up on it. Now, if you have a negative experience that's like dehumanizing, then I don't tell you to go back to that space. But if it's a the meeting wasn't ran the way you wanted it or the topic of discussion for that meeting wasn't what you thought it would be um, i might urge you to go back or use your skills of reaching out to people and contact the president or some leadership in that organization say hey i came into this meeting thinking this and is this something that i could get out of this meeting um, i think that could help as well and you're helping that student build um, critical skills of engaging one-on-one -on -one, asking important questions uh, follow up with people um, research essentially diving deeper into trying to figure out information you need so i, I would i would not jump to trying to create your own um until you've done the your due diligence of figuring out the true mission of that club and organization and to know that not to allow people to deter you from a mission of an organization that you can create your own identity within an organization um because i mean you see it often uh, for example, you may join a fraternity and you may drop your letters like a semester later. I'm like, whoa, that was the, that, that's this particular group of people at this particular environment. You are not thinking about the global impact of X organization. If it's a financial group, uh, if they're not thinking about financial literacy in the context of thinking about race and the implications of or how the overlapping systems of racism and uh, geographic area and gender and socioeconomic class overlap to cause some people success and some not, you can have that conversation in that org. Um, so that's what you bring, like you contribute that. They may be missing that void. So there's a, there's a place always, I think in an organization, just create that place for you. Um, so that, that would be my guidance. If I could chime in on that. Um, 
I remember when I was going into undergrad and uh, I, although I knew what I wanted to do as far as my major, it was more so like I didn't know how I, was, how I would fit into the overall campus community outside of the EOP program that I was a part of. Um, so uh, I tried everything. I was like, hey, I'm going to go to the Japanese Association. I'm going to go to the, you know, uh, Latinx. I'm going to go to the, you know, uh, Middle Eastern uh, clubs and organizations events just to kind of just see what's out there and, um, and kind of see what sparked within myself. And I, you know, it, it went out that my little uh, curiosity took me to learning a little bit of Japanese, a little Arabic, uh, you know, it just like, it took me into places and introduced me to people from all around the world. Um, and that, that kind of fed something inside of me like, hey, I want to travel. Like, you know, I want to, uh, I want to get to know people where I'm not, you know, that I'm not familiar with. Um, you know, I live, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, because it's very diverse, but, you know, how often do you get the chance to actually interact with people from, you know, the different ethnicities um, and backgrounds that you live around? Because, you know, you know, like on New York City subway, you look at somebody like, wait, what are you looking at? <laughs> but, um, you know, but that, but the reason, my, but I guess the thing is like, find out what it is that you're interested in and understand like that, hey, this is why I'm attending. Whether you have good good or bad experiences, as Jarvis said, understand like, hey, your reason, you know, you being there is important. And I'll just raise one other thing is that uh, uh, <laughs> I remember being, I remember wanting to be uh, running for uh, student government president. That's like, that was one of my biggest goals as undergrad. And um, <laughs> and then I got to know people that was in the student government and one, not too many people that looked like me. I was just like, hey, like, I don't see too many people that look like me. And then the people were there were just like, they, I didn't like how they conducted themselves. I don't think they were really, you know, upholding <laughs> the, the point, the whole point of student government. So I didn't join, but I still was involved in some aspects and joined something like the Multicultural Alliance or the Multicultural Center. And we had uh, different groups of people, you know, from different backgrounds that were able to just like, hey, like, what do you want to do, and how do, you, how can we support you? And even, even, even when I was supported, I got some pushback because I'm half Native American as well. And so we lived around like I went to SUNY Plattsburgh, and Plattsburgh is right outside Native American, <laughs> you know, um, you know, territory. So it's just like, hey, why aren't there any, you know, Native American influences or like? you know, you know, celebration of American, Native American people on campus. So I felt like we needed to identify that. And I got so much pushback, not only from my peers, but the administrators that was guiding, <laughs> like, hey, like, why would you, why would we want to do this? I'm like, why not? And so I literally had to conduct a whole program around, you know, Native American storytelling, like the past, the present, and the future of Native Americans and, you know, in, in that area and invited, you know, the local uh, tribe to come down and tell their stories. And, then they, and even actually identified a, a whole community of students on campus who, you know, identified as Native American as well. And it was just an amazing thing to kind of like see um, be created and, you know, and people connected with one another that, you know, they, they knew each other, but like, hey, they didn't know this about one another and they didn't know about this culture that we were surrounded by in upstate New York, on the Rhonda. <laughs> and so, um, I, so I, I'll just, you know, tell students like, hey, there's gonna be things where it's gonna be very seamless and easy, but it's also things that you're gonna have to kind of push and fight through to make sure that, you know, you're represented and your voice is represented. And I think that's what's going to, you know, create uh, growth within yourself. And then it's also going to make an impression on the people that you're interacting on, like this is who you are. And that goes a long way. Um, and, you know, not only in school, but also beyond school. I, I, I think the only thing I have to add is, yeah, you telling or my advice would be students need to understand that they belong. Wherever they are, they belong. And sometimes, um, I, and I went through this as an undergrad myself, going into networking situations where I'll say it was very hoity-toity. <laughs> and I was not, it was very strange to occupy that space as somebody who comes from um, a low-income background myself, right? And I had to, like, I really felt like I didn't belong. But if somebody had said to me, no, you belong wherever you are, right? <laughs> I might have been thinking about that a little differently and and had um 
I think, put more effort into those experiences. But what I did do was, okay, I didn't feel like I belonged in this space. So where do I feel like I belong? And then in the spaces where there was um, a, a dearth, right? Okay, we, we created things. So we created an urban theater, for instance, because the theater um, group on our campus was very white and white-centric and Eurocentric. And so we wanted to have um, other stories told. So we created urban theater <laughs> and we had our own plays and we sold out. I mean, th that's the kind of stuff. And that was hard, right, to, to have to build a constitution and um, to go and get signatures and then to go get um, people to join us in our efforts. Um, but that created a learning situation for myself that I carry to this day. Um, and I think that if students just can understand that this is their campus and that they belong, and in addition, if they see things that are not, you know, where they want it to be, or if they, if there's something missing, then they can create it. And in doing so, they're learning a lot in that process. Yeah, I love that the common theme here really is give it a try, like go to those organizations. But if it's not working out, carve your own path, right? Or really take that initiative to kind of assess what's going on at that organization. And if you as an individual can kind of improve it for the better so that other voices are being included because that's so, so important. So um, my last question for you is, do you have advice for students that want to start similar initiatives at the Binghamton campus or other campuses or are kind of looking to connect with you guys? Um, yes. <laughs> There's so much of it. Um, I would just say that uh, be prepared that it's going to be a lot of work to get started. Um, and if you can wrap your mind around that, that's, that's probably the first step <laughs> you need to, um, I think also really planning, um, men of excellence was a well thought out idea before it became a reality. Right. And, and I had allies, right. It was Jarvis and we have, um, our, a gentleman who works on our campus named Scott, our three minds combined to figure out what it was that we wanted to do, what this group was specifically about. And it, also is important that you that you outline that because other people will try to tell you what the group should be about and um that's not you know we can't be everything to everyone right we have to focus on what what the task is at hand and really be specific and intentional about what the plan is um and then i would say um roll with the punches because there are going to be hiccups and everything is not going to go smoothly just know that the work that you're doing is righteous and it's important and it's it's sorely needed on our campuses yeah i think um echo everything that vanessa just shared i think there's a for students i think that you all students need to hear reach out to your stu student activity center reach out to your if you have a multicultural area and loop in career services and here's why student activities they're getting paid to do this multicultural affairs they're getting paid to do this career services they can help you with what vanessa just talked about with ensuring that you already you have your clear cut out defined mission they can help you with the language of uh making sure if you have a mission statement it's act it's correct and concise and understandable uh, this is what they do for a living help folks convey their message via a cover letter or a resume um, so if they if you ask could they maybe look at this resource that you have and want to prepare this document it might be able to help if not career services you probably have a writing center um, that could help really craft out some uh, a good constitution um, that's free of Sometimes some schools have policies. If there's some typos, it may be sent back to you and you have to resubmit and go through the process again. So do your due diligence, due diligence of editing and revising. At the same time, institutions have a responsibility to creating these, to knowing that these programs need to happen. And for example, like I'm in a color program, these are institutionalized student support programs that should be funded and staffed and have budgets. Um, I kind of put, I moved beyond the student club and org for these kind of programs. They both can exist at the same time, um, a men of color student success program and also a men of color club and organization. Uh, um, I think that's really my 
kind of guidance or two cents, but definitely getting the professional staff in the mix. Um, and if your first kind of guidance is going to a student that a club that might be similar to you, ask them for their constitution uh, and see if you can kind of not copy and paste, but use it as guidance. Uh, if you're new to writing those student activities mandated constitution type bylaws documents. And also I would add to that, that um, as uh, um, my office and diversity, equity, inclusion office at SUNY, we've been trying to identify, um, you know, what campuses have what, you know, men of color initiatives going around at SUNY. So I guess the first question I would encourage students to ask, is there anything currently, you know, um, going on that's supporting men of color in this, in this capacity? Uh, because it, Tom, I think uh, a lot of the times, at least from the diversity conference that we, were, that we presented at um, last winter, it was that a lot of interest, there was a lot of interest on the faculty staff point of view, but the student, um, there, was, there was no connection with the student or like, you know, it was hard to get students to be committed to a men of color program. <laughs> so um, definitely, you know, reach out to those, those initiative, I mean, to those uh, administrators and faculty that Jarvis just mentioned, and also think long-term. Like, um, I, although I wasn't able to, you know, be a part of the men of color, uh, you know, jumpstart, uh, I do have some experience in, you know, starting organizations around men of color of my own. I was a chapter founder for Alpha Phi, for Alpha Phi Fraternity Corporate at SUNY Plattsburgh, the chapter there called Upsilon Kappa. And, you know, that took, you know, years, like literally three years of my college experience to, to, uh, to think about, to, yes sir, <laughs> and to also um, get people involved and, and to also get faculty that's going to be invested for the long run. Because um, sometimes if you don't have, once you leave, you want to make sure that, that that initiative and that idea is still there to thrive. So you want some type of faculty or staff that's going to be, you know, there to, to usher in the, uh, the same level of, uh, you know, guidance and care that you put in to get that program started. Um, and, may, and then one of the problems may be going to a predominantly white school that you don't have, um, you know, men of color per, uh, staff or administrator that to, to kind of um, support you. I mean, but I would give as a, for example, Vanessa, right? Vanessa is not a man of color. <laughs> She's a woman of color. And, you know, and that, and you might have to be a little bit more open and even might be encountering somebody who's not of color, right? Um, and getting them involved and interested in, you know, guiding you through that space. Cause you know, there are, there are a lot of allies that we can lean on to get this initiative started. So um, I definitely, you know, we'll take it there, just that, um, ask that question, what's going on currently, and then try to be strategic about long-term, about how this is going to exist even after you leave. Um, and then also try to cultivate, you know, not only the students that you're going to school with, but the ones who are coming behind and coming behind you to kind of, you know, plant that seed, to grow that initiative to something even bigger than you ever imagined. I just wanted to add something based off of what Mark was saying. Um, if I'm talking, if I'm giving advice to faculty and staff who are on an institute or at an institution where there are very few um, people of color or men of color in particular, um, I would just say, don't think that you can't just because you're not the right gender. Um, because I, I struggled with that actually. Um, and Jarvis actually helped me out a lot with that because um, I was very quick to say, okay, you go for, forward and be the face of this, and I will sit back and do all the administrative stuff. And um, he encouraged me. He said, you know, your perspective is valuable, right? I think you told me, I think his direct quote was, everything I've ever learned was from a woman or something, something to that effect. And I was just like, that would hit me like, oh, okay, Jarvis, I'll come. You know, so I started going to the meetings and I found that, you know, I, it wasn't as awkward as I thought it was going to be. I had a place at that table, um, and I think that the students felt it was an important space or place to be at um, for me to be there as well. But I, I would just say if you're lacking um, a lot of folks of color on your campus or, or men of color in particular, don't be afraid to see that there's a need and go address it anyway um, because it's needed, period. Um, and it, like I said before, it's righteous work, so you need to do it. Yeah, all really solid advice. Jarvis did mention career services. I work at a career center, so 
feel free to connect with me. I'm happy to read over any documents that you have. Thank you so much. I am just happy and humbled that these three are part of my network. They're doing great work. They're amazing people. They are super, super committed. And I know that students found this conversation really valuable. And thank you to all the students that are watching. I will see you on the next one.